God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The sermon for the fourth Sunday of Lent is Achieving Immunity, based on Numbers 21 and John chapter 3. The sermon title is Achieving Immunity. The scriptures for today could not be more meaningful to me. In the book of Numbers, we read about Moses lifting up the serpent in, on a pole in the wilderness. And all who looked upon the bronze serpent were saved. They would live. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the Gospel of John describes Jesus as the one who is lifted up. And once again, all who come to the light of Jesus are saved they have eternal life. And I think that it is very appropriate to, de to define eternal life not only as life after death, but also including the quality of life here and now. So eternal life also means healing and wholeness, completeness, shalom. So today, our focus is on healing. How do we achieve wholeness? How do we achieve immunity? So when I think about the bronze serpent in the wilderness and Jesus on the cross as what heals us, I thought about the medical profession and all the science and technology researchers, doctors, nurses and aides who have worked tirelessly for over a year now to bring healing in the midst of a pandemic that has killed over 2.6 million people worldwide and over 530,000 in the U.S. So in preparation for this sermon and in reflection upon that which is lifted up on a pole is what heals us. I read obituaries of nurses who have died from COVID in the last 12 months. I read the obituary of Jeanette Williams Parker, who at age 48 was the first nurse in the state of West Virginia to die of COVID. Her mother said that she always worked tirelessly in her profession as a nurse and just never thought that it would happen to her. I read about Renata McGuire, a single mother of six and a home health aide who died at age 39 in Florida. She was described as being tough, never backed down from anything. Then there's Samantha Hickey at age 45, a nurse practitioner in Southwest Idaho, who was described as tenacious mama bear. And she learned to diagnose more quickly than others, even some doctors, because she listened so well to her patients. Evelyn Caro didn't become a nurse until the age of 50 and she practiced for 19 years. Then she retired and then she came out of retirement to work part-time at a women's health clinic where she contracted COVID and died last April at the age of 69 in Baltimore. Kyle's Kelly was an ER nurse manager at Mount Sinai West in New York City. And when he died in March of last year at the age of 48, he was probably the first nurse in New York City to die of COVID and his friends and family highlighted his death as unnecessary and asked for medical personnel to have more protective equipment. His sister described him this way. Kyle's was not a victim. He served with love. If you needed care, you would get it. He ran toward the oncoming enemy determined to bring survivors back with him. 
That's who he was. Doctors have the prestige and make more money, but they, in reality, and because of the course of their profession, they spend very little time with the patient. It is the nurses, especially ICU nurses working in COVID units who spend long hours with patients, often in small rooms with no windows. And since no family can visit, it is the nurses who brush their teeth, who shave men's beards, who bathe their patients. They console the anxious and develop relationships with them. They are the ones who set up FaceTime and Zoom calls with families. They are the ones who do life review as patients near the end of life. The nurses are the ones who hold the patient's hands as they die. Nurses are overworked and underpaid. They're stressed and have dealt with as much death as what is usually seen on battlefields during war. And they too are undergoing trauma, moral injury, as a result of the jobs that they love. Day after day, they are lifting up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. They are bearing the light of Christ, bringing God's healing presence to hospital beds, often at the cost of their own physical and emotional and spiritual well being. So today, I am lifting up nurses as they work to bring healing and wholeness to others while they are themselves in desperate need of shalom. So I wear masks. I wear a mask for the nurses and aides and all the healthcare workers who have been our bronze serpent in the pandemic wilderness. common symbol of the medical profession is a snake on a pole. Perhaps you've seen this on ambulances. Perhaps you've seen it as the icon of the World Health Organization. The snake on a pole, similar to the Bible story of Moses healing the people in the wilderness. Sometimes it is a symbol of two snakes derived from Greek mythology. It's interesting that the Gospel of John gives this same symbolism as a way to understand Jesus. So as Christians, we look to Christ, high and lifted up, drawing all the world to the light, Christ as our healer, our protector, and our peace. In medical terms, we might say it this way, that Christ provides us with immunity. What is immunity? How is immunity achieved? Those of you who have received the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines, you know that this is not a guarantee that you will not contract the SARS virus. But what it does mean is that you have over a 90% chance that the SARS virus, when it comes to you, will not send you to the ER or to the morgue. This is how we can understand our life with Christ. This does not mean that our life with Christ, that nothing bad will ever happen to us. But it does mean that we have immunity from the sickness and death caused by all the chaos and violence and pain that we encounter as we live our lives. We can, with God's help, as it has been said, go placidly among the noise and strife. Immunity. Immunity in the most general sense of the term means to preserve the integrity of the organism. So a vaccine helps preserve the integrity of our bodies. Otherwise, the SARS virus attacks 
and damages our bodies, our vital organs, including the heart and lung and kidneys and brain. And our baptism, becoming one with Christ, provides us with immunity in the sense that it protects the integrity of our souls. Otherwise, the wiles of the world would overwhelm us. I say that nurses, aides, and all those working, even at this very hour in hospitals and clinics here in our neighborhoods and across the nation and the world, that these nurses and aides are working to preserve the integrity of our common life in our communities, our common life as Americans, our common life as humans across the globe. And so if we understand immunity in this way, protecting the integrity of the organism, we can expand the metaphor to include leaders. Our job is to provide immunity as well. So a good leader, whether that is a president or a governor or a city manager or a pastor or a business owner or a work supervisor, or a grandparent in a family system. Those good leaders provide immunity to the system by protecting the system from chaos. Good leadership means that all the moving parts work together for the good of the whole. That's integrity. And if a church or a workplace or a family or a country has integrity, that means everyone matters and everyone is contributing that, and then that means that that system has immunity. It can weather any storm. As I told the session recently, our leadership here in this church has provided immunity. Immunity in the sense that as best we know how, and with God's help, the church has remained stable. We have provided a continuity of care. We have continued our worship and our mission. We have even moved forward with new initiatives under unprecedented circumstances. I am so grateful for that. If your life feels out of whack, Lent, now is the time to reflect on the integrity of your emotional and spiritual system. For you cannot achieve immunity whether you have self-destructive behaviors or self-defeating thoughts. For example, a brain that is on a constant diet of anger and division and pettiness means that that same related spirit will also be defiant and in turmoil. None of us are perfect and none of us are immune to the waves of sin and death. But God doesn't expect complete perfection, complete immunity in this life. But God, with God's help, we can achieve and work towards some level of immunity. And what I mean by achieving immunity is immunity in the sense of finding balance and harmony and wholeness and shalom in the way that we live our lives. My friends, I implore you to never underestimate your ability to provide immunity within the system that you exist. This could be with the people in your life, like your friends, your grandkids, your church, your neighborhood, your place of employment. Through your love, through your devotion, through the way that you live your life, the choices that you make every day in doing that, relying upon God's wisdom and God's guidance that you protect 
the integrity of those under your care, just by doing small but vital acts of love. It is in this way that we can be like Christ lifted high on a cross. Or perhaps if that's too overwhelming, maybe we can work to be like those ER, ICU, COVID nurses through sacrifice, through the ability to put aside our own ego and shine a light for others. That will impact lives for years and generations to come. Never underestimate your ability as a leader within your system, within your family, within your work, your friends, and your community to be a light for Christ. One in three Americans know someone who has died of COVID in the last 12 months. As the president prayed in his speech on Thursday evening, please God, give solace to those who lost someone. And to that I add my prayers of peace and comfort for all those working on the front lines who are exhausted and suffering emotional trauma. And it is my prayer for us here today that God may grant each of us solace and strength as we do what we can to be calm, stable, loving, forgiving, and graceful people, lifting up the sacrifice of Christ as the way to achieve immunity, achieving immunity in this life and in the next. Amen.